Good morning and welcome to online service here at House of Power Outreach. I'm Pastor Tori, Pastor Ian, and our senior pastors here at our church. And we just love and thank God for you joining us. We'd love to see you in person at 10 a.m. Uh, here at the church and, and, and just have a blast. So let's pray. We're going to get into the word. Father, we just pray and we thank you. We thank you, Father, for continued comfort of Jessica and the entire Nahara Rocha family, Lord God, and I just pray for peace of their heart as we lay Johnny to rest this Friday. And, uh, and we just pray, Father God, for them continually growing together and needing each other and being there for one another. Father, we just thank you for blessing the word. We thank you, Father God, that I decrease and you increase. Give us ears to hear what the Spirit of God has to say. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. I want to apologize for the fatigue in my face and eyes and voice. It's been days of many speakings and the daughter's safely in Maine and Pastor Rita's safely back here. And so we're truly blessed, but we're going to do the word anyway, amen. So today is about staying usable. You know, we talked about so much and and, you know, just stay usable. And, and one of the most times we, the, the two times that uh, believers become unusable or hard to be used is in their blessings and when they don't have, and when they're not feeling like they're being blessed and when they're not getting what they want. And so, but God is telling us to stay usable no matter what. Paul says, I know how to be a base and I know how to be a bound, but in all things, I know how to be content. There's a powerful thing about being usable. You know, that means that the enemy has nowhere to go to take you out of the will of God and take you out of what God has called you to do. Your being usable also means that you got to use your words. You got to speak up when God gives you a word and it doesn't matter who it's to and, and, and what, you know, you know, what the content of it is when it's from God, you need to give that word. You're saving lives and, and positioning people to be in their very best for God, you know, stay usable. Well, I don't want to offend them, but you want to offend God. So you got to figure out who you're going to live for. Just either going to live for man, or you're going to live for God. And, and in those places, staying usable is exactly what that is. And it isn't about talent. It's about availability. There are talented people, gifted people that are sitting around doing nothing because they would not stay usable because they thought their greatest place was where their talent was and not being a gift is very different than having a talent. Be a gift, be a gift, be a blessing to someone. The Bible says in Genesis 12, 2, we're blessed to be a blessing. So that's your derb. There's nothing too hard for God. And that's what we got to remember. You know, one of the greatest things in being able to stay usable is realize we serve a God that can do anything at any time and anywhere in any place. And so in Matthew chapter 14, verse 15 through 21, it says, and when it was evening, his disciples came to him saying, this is the desert place. And the time is now past. Send the multitude away that they may go into the villages and buy themselves a vit, uh, buy themselves victuals. But Jesus said unto them, they need not depart. Give ye them to eat. And they say unto him, we have there but five loaves and two fish. He said, bring them hither to me. And he commanded the multitudes to sit down on the grass and took the five loaves and the two fish and looking up in, looking up to heaven, and he blessed and break and gave the loaves to his disciples and the disciples to the multitudes. And they did all eat and were filled. And they took up of the fragments that remained 12 baskets full. And they that had eaten were about 5,000 men beside women and children. So you say 5,000 men beside women and children, possibly 20,000 people sat down to eat, uh, if not more. So you think about that and what they started with, right? What you start with is not what you're stuck with. He said, you're not stuck there. There's, there's a level of blessing that I can bring from what, what's, a, what's right now. See, well, again, there are a lot of things we're trying to get to, but God said, can I take what's usable now? And we gotta be willing to let God take what's usable. Not one day, not when I get it together, not on the way, but once I get all it, nah, -uh. let, let me take what's usable now. Let me take the prayer life you have now. Let me take the worship you have now. Let me take the praise you have now. Because when you make it bigger, you may not want to give it. So right now, just let me let me take what's usable. Let be usable. Be usable. Don't 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 try to be great. Be usable. And that's the greatest thing you can do. The multitudes were fed by a boy who wasn't even counted initially. Initially, it says 5,000 men. But the boy who wasn't counted had everything that was needed. There are parts of your life, there are parts of my life that no one ever counted to have made it this far. They counted it out. 
But what's not counted is the very thing that we need to live off of that's going to feed us. The very part of you that no one thought would ever be here, the very part of you that no one else said would never be successful, they will, they will not make it because of that is the very thing that's holding your two fish and your five loaves. It is the thing that Jesus says to bring to him. Bring it to him. And so it, it was counted the food that wasn't enough. Jesus didn't get rid of the problem. This is what the disciples says. God, they need, they hungry. It's too late. Let's send them away. And, and, and they, he said, no, let, you feed them. You feed them. Hey, church, instead of praying to get rid of that job, you work better on that job. Instead of saying, Let's, let me divorce this marriage. No, you work better at that. You feed it. You feed it. You give them to eat. You give that marriage to eat. You give your children to eat. You give that job to eat. You give ministry to eat. You give vision to eat. You, you give it to eat. He said, you feed them. Quit trying to send things away when God has anointed you to feed it. And so in the presence of God, he wants to bless and fill and nourish us, not run from problems. If they sat there to hear the word, why not nourish them with physical things? So he said that, and so he's telling them, don't get rid of the problem that they were facing. He showed the disciples that there is power with what was available. So I, 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 and I believe this was a message to, for us to quit praying for problems to go away and start believing that there is nothing too hard for God. See, because again, when I'm starting, God, God, get rid of it. God, get rid of it. God, get rid of it. He says, I'm the one here. Why we need to get rid of something that we can handle? Why are we chasing things away when I've anointed you to be an overcomer? I said, you go to do works I do and do greater works. Why, why, why are we sending stuff away? Why are we sending out a problem? Well, man, that's, that's cancer. That's the heart disease. That's that. That's big. That's something. That's this sin. That's that sin. Don't send it away. You feed what I've given you. Feed it the word. Feed it prayer. Feed it intercessory. Feed it rebuke. Whatever God is telling you, you feed it. We don't have to chase it away. And so God has, has called us to the point uh, of saying that there's a blessing, there's, there's, an, there's an abundance of, of in us that, that should be there. So this was that message to quit praying for plot problems to go away. So God, Jesus took this and he said, he took the lunch that wasn't enough in the eyes of man. Remember that. It wasn't enough. Disciple says, this is all we got. In the eyes of men, Five loaves, two fish to 5,000 men plus their women and children is not enough in the eyes of man. But whose IQ are we working on? We ain't going to ever be able to get rid of IQ, y'all. It's never going to go away. We're going to have to hang on to IQ forever. Whose IQ was he working with? He said, "Get bring it to me. In the eyes of men, in the low intelligence of faith, in the low intelligence of spirit, came to Jesus who had high intelligence of the spirit and the anointing of God because he is all things to all God. I mean, he's all things to all people. He is the God of everything. He is El Shaddai, the God that's more than enough. His IQ looked at the five loaves, two fishes and said, this is plenty. And this is what he did with it. He took it. He took what wasn't enough in the eyes of the disciples and gave thanks for what was not enough. What you have now. Give thanks for it. Quit waiting until you get something else. Quit waiting until something else turn into something else. Give thanks for what you have. Present that. The thing that seems not enough, you're looking at your bank account. Not enough. Take it. Here, God, I want you to bless this. Bless this and break it and send it out. Bless this and give it out. Bless this, Lord God. Send this out. Whatever's not enough. My child is not doing enough in school. Here, I present my child. Bless them. Send it out. My marriage isn't being enough. There isn't enough love. There isn't enough fellowship. Enough communication. Here, right? what's not? Here you go, God. Bless it. Bless it and break it. Break it, Lord God, because this thing has been, this not enough has been holding together for too long. This never good enough is holding together too long. Nuh-uh. I, I'm bringing this to you. My attitude is not enough. I bring it to you. This thing I'm worried about, that's not enough. I'm bringing it to you. Let him bless it. Let him bless it. Your authority, your God-given authority, let God be the one that blesses it and takes you to the next level of your relationship with him. And so he, he blessed it. So whatever we have from God will always become enough under the presence of a grateful heart. See, it, it, it comes from God. You got to be grateful. Give thanks for what is too little in your hands and watch God turn it into more than enough in his hands. It's too little because it's in your hands. It's not enough because it's in your hands. 
but you take it to God and he'll bless it and break it and make it more than enough. You got to give it. You got to give that thanks. You got to speak over it. Speak the word. People have kind of uh, downgraded confession because some things that they don't agree with and they don't believe in. But by the way, the Bible says to walk in confession. Call those things that be not as though they are. He says that. That's what the Bible says. And you can let someone make you stop confessing and make someone make you stop speaking the word over your life. And I'm not talking about a confessional booth where you're going to tell somebody your sins because that's not what God called you to do. Take your sins to God. What I'm saying is you need to speak over your situation with your God given authority and speak the word over it. Let the word come out of your mouth. Let that speak. Be rich with the word of God. Let it dwell in you richly. So speak that, speak that word over it. And so when you begin to do that with a great heart, give thanks for what is too little in your hands. Being ungrateful will lead to not trusting God to be faithful. See, when we're ungrateful, the thing of it is, is that we're saying, well, God, you know, I, I don't want to uh, put in a position where I even get to see your faithfulness. You got to go back and say, I'm going to be grateful for what God has done, what God has done in the past, what God is going to do in the future, and what God is currently doing in my life. I got to be grateful there. I got to be understanding that my God is bigger. My God is bigger. I need to praise him. Jesus fed them according to the Lord's prayer, right? Give us this day our daily bread. The five loaves is less than what? What is that? That's not even because uh, the 500 is, is uh, 5,000 is 10 percent. 50 is 1 percent. That's a point of 1 percent. Like, come on, man. That's half a percent. That ain't even, you know, it's, it's like, and God says, I don't need the percentages on my side. My hands are eternal. And see, this is where I, I do, and I, I deal with where people say, well, you know, there's no way, they, they, and even this point, I know it's just kind of going off, but, but this just needs to be said. I was just, as I was praying and thinking about this the other day, that people go like, this world is a billion years old. I go, no, 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 it isn't. It's about over, about 6,000 years old because that's when God created it. Well, it's got a billion years. He's got eternal hands. In his hands, whatever he shapes got many, many years on it. Got many years that we can't even count because it's in his hands. And it's like Michelangelo in his hands, the art in his hands, what he can do with a stone, what he can do. Come on, man. It, 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 was, it, was, it was immaculate. In my hands, I ain't gonna, I'm not going to be able to make what he makes. And that's where we got to understand. We need to quit doing too many believers. Well, I'll give you that. I'll give you the world. Made I can't give you that because that's not what the Bible says. The Bible said it was dark and without form. How can it be made a million years ago if it was dark without form when God got to? So you got to understand that in God's hand, the same thing with anything you're believing God for, put it in his hands. He'll shape it. He'll shape it. He'll put it together. He'll, he'll, he'll bless it and break it. So in John 6, 35, Jesus was serious about feeding us to the point that we would never hunger again. So he's not calling us to be hungry somewhere else. He said, I'm feeding you. To where the fact that you don't have to go be hungry somewhere else. And we, again, as the body of Christ, as the body of Christ, as believers, to stay usable, we need to quit eating at someone else's table. God says, I prepared a table for you in the presence of your enemies. If you eat at somebody else's table, you eat in for what enemies that are facing them. And God has said, you need to be eating at the table that I've prepared for you because you know you got enemies coming after you as well. So quit eating at somebody else's table and start dining at the table that God has called you to dine in so that you can stay usable. You know, you're not user friendly when you're eating someone else's meal that does not nourish you. When you're eating someone else's problems, that does not nourish you. Yeah, you come together in agreement, but God is saying in order for you to stay usable, you need to eat at your table. He says, I will give you bread so that you'll never hunger again, which means that there's something in you that no matter how big the problem is, it's bigger than that problem because it's not just today. It's daily bread. It comes bigger than that. Listen to this in Mark chapter 10 and verse 49. Uh, 49 through 42. It says, and Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. And they called the blind man saying unto him, be of good comfort, rise. He called it, he called thee. And he casting away his garment rose and came to Jesus. And Jesus answered and said unto him, what wilt thou that I should do unto thee? The blind man said unto him, Lord, that I might receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, go thy way, thy faith had made the whole and immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus in 
the way. There's so many things that are happening to unpack out of this because first of all, it's blind Bartimaeus. When blind Bartimaeus felt the presence of God, even as a, as a person who didn't know him, he cried out, Jesus, come, heal me, son of the living God. He's screaming out loud. They're trying to get him to be quiet. But let me tell you something. When you know that you know that God is right there and God is near you and God has been with you and God has stepped with you, that you are not going to miss a moment to call out to God. You are going to want to call out to God. You're going to want to make sure that no matter who's looking, I don't care what you think about me. I need God now. It's, that's right. You think whatever because you're not the one I'm calling to be here for me because you can't. And so you call out to God. And it says this, Jesus called to Bartimaeus and his healing began the minute he stepped toward Jesus. Most times people say, God, I'm asking you to heal me from being blind. And God says, come to me. God, I need you to, to heal my life. I've been hurt. Come to church. Well, I don't want to come to church. Well, until you step in that direction and step in the direction of Jesus, your healing can begin. But look at blind Bartimaeus. He jumps up. He steps toward God, the steps of a good man, they are ordered of the Lord. Every place you place your foot, call it God's land. Don't, don't, don't ever underestimate the direction and stepping toward Jesus. And when Bartimaeus threw off his coat, he started to live like a person who had sight because blind people set things down. Blind people don't just throw things around because they need to go back and find them without sight. But Bartimaeus knew it ain't no need for me to be setting stuff down. I'll be able to find it no matter where I throw it because now I'm going to have sight. Where I'm headed, I'm headed to get sight. I don't have to live like a blind person. Let me tell you something, saints of the living God, quit living like you're sick. Quit living like you're lost. Quit living like you're not healed. Quit living like you're not an overcomer. Quit living like you're not victorious. Quit living like you're not courageous. Quit living like you don't know how to pray. Quit living like you don't know how to serve. It is the mighty God who says, throw off the coat. And see, too many times we're too okay with living halfway. And we're keeping a coat on, a coat that does not design you to see clearly because it was made up for you to set things down. And if you just set your past and you set behaviors that does not go along with your life with Christ, you set them down, you're going to go back and you're going to get blinded and then you're going to be able to go right back to old things. This is why people can go right back in the stuff that they were delivered from because they set them down instead of threw them off and that's the power of the song Reckless. Be reckless toward running toward God. I don't want to be able to find what I used to be anymore. I don't want to be able to find the old behaviors. I don't want to be. Quit looking up people that used to be in your past relationship. Quit looking them up on social media. Quit trying to find them. That is a blind eye that that causes to be able to look for them. And, and listen to this. And when I'm throwing that off, he started to live like a person who had sight. Blind people don't set things down. I mean, don't throw things down. They set them down. The coat also delivered him from the live, livelihood of being blind. It was a beggar's coat. He wore the coat that symbolized begging. Now listen, he was begging because he was blind and because he was blind, he could not take care of himself. But now he was going to the one who was going to help him see. There's no need to be begging when God has blessed you. Hey, look, quit trying to beg for people to be in your life when God has blessed you. You were blind until you came to Christ. You didn't see how toxic they were for your relationship. You couldn't see how toxic it was for you to be there. And now go ahead and throw that off because God is never wanting you to beg for someone to love you. You don't have to audition for their friendship anymore. You don't have to audition for their love anyone. The King of Kings, Lord of Lords, he loved you. He has brought people in your life. He has brought your spouse in your life. You're fighting for friendships that never loved you, never cared for you. They don't care if you're up or down. In fact, they'd rather you be down so they can have something to talk about. He says, throw the coat off, throw that relationship off, throw that opinion off. Quit going back to find it. Quit remembering the time you fell. Quit remembering the mistakes you made. Quit remembering the old things. Quit finding that stuff. Throw it away where it cannot be found because you're going to be able to see why was I wearing that for so long. As you come to Christ, he'll be able to see it. He'll be able to see Jesus more than the problem. It's not your livelihood anymore. You don't have to live to see if they're going to answer back on a text. That's not your livelihood anymore. You don't have to live for their comment, for their appreciation. The one day they're going to, someday they're going to, they're going to be proud of you. You don't have to live for that anyway, anymore. Jesus loves you. 
And so God will provide us with his leftovers so we don't have to keep our own. See, those are just leftovers. Cold, cold food, cold emotions is like cold food. You, no matter how much you warm it up, it'll never taste like the original. Coldness from people who, who, who left you and abandoned you. Quit trying to warm that up. Quit trying to microwave that love. Jesus said, I come hot every day with the anointing of the Holy Spirit. You don't have to live off that cold food, that, that overnight. Them I, got, I got 12 baskets full that I'm providing for you. That's going to be daily. That's going to be warmed up daily. You don't have to live off that. You can go forward and live off what God has for you. So God will provide his leftovers. Don't keep that old stuff. First, Jesus told Bartimaeus, go your way. Then Bartimaeus followed. He made Jesus way his own way and was a follower of him. Bartimaeus must have figured, now that I have my sight, I always want to go look upon Jesus. The first thing he saw was him headed in Jesus' way. First thing you need to get up and do is see God. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Everything else will be added. See God first. See the king first. See the king first. Go his way. You can't go his way when you're seeing all this other stuff and putting all these other things in front of you. There's too many detours. Quit having detours. Go his way. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 13 through 17, it says, Therefore take up the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you will be able to stand your ground. And having done everything to stand, stand firm then, then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist with the breastplate of righteousness arrayed. And with your feet fitted with the readiness of the gospel of peace, in addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. The armor of God isn't a spiritual outfit. It's not a spiritual outfit. It is a spirit-filled lifestyle. Too many people, I'm putting on my helmet, I'm putting on my armor. No, it's a lifestyle. You shouldn't have to be redressing in salvation. You're, you're saved. You're born again. You're born again. You don't have to redress in your faith. You need to use. You've been given the measure of faith. You, you, you got the Prince of Peace in you. You shot it already. You fit it. Your feet are fitted for peace. You fit it. You got it. You fit. Your shoes fit. Your fit. Your piece fits. Quit trying to shove something else in there. Quit trying to wear stuff too big for you. Remember, you ever try to wear shoes that are too big for you? You have to put socks in them. Come on, quit trying to wear. You trying to you trying to fit into your problems. God said, fit into my piece. I got shoes fit for you. You don't have to, it's it's custom made. There's a difference between having a suit that you just got and you just put on that took off the rack or somebody gave it to you. It don't. It, but when you got one cut for you, come on now. When it's cut for you, it's shaped for you. It's fitted for you. Can't everybody put your suit on? It's your fit. It's your fit. Walk with peace. You got, you've been fitted for peace. Come on, now we got peace. Quit walking scared. Quit walking in fear. Quit walking in doubt. You got peace. Put your shoes on. And then keep them on. Then walk like you got them on. That's peace. When we understand it as a lifestyle, the day of evil can only catch us in the midst of fellowship and with God and not having a response to negative situations. Listen, li okay, let me say this right because I'm, I'm too wound up. Prayer is about the goodness of God, not the badness of your situation. And I know badness ain't a word, but listen, too many times people pray as a response to badness and not because God is good. If your prayer, if you're praying without ceasing, you're praying because you're praying to a good God, not a bad problem, not a bad situation. Come on, man, I pray because my God is good. It, 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 Listen, we all grew up under this. A lot of us grew up under this where people say, well, this got bad. It's time to pray. Time to pray? When was it time out from praying? But we grew up with that. Let me tell you, it's always prayer time. It's always prayer. Prayer time never runs out. It's always prayer time. And so you go with that, that I'm praying because of the goodness of God. When people say, I've been praying, what's, when folks ask you what's wrong because you've been praying. What's wrong? What's good? It's what's right. I pray because what's right. My God is right. I'm right with my God. That's what's right. Man, pray. Pray like you want to. Literally, prayer should be a believer's daily flow. It's your flow. Feeding the multitudes and healing the blind was a part of Jesus' overflow that flowed from his daily fellowship with the Father. Now, the Bible says, given it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. 
there's an overflow that comes from your daily flow. Flow daily with Jesus and he'll overflow you in everything that you do. In everything that you do. Uh, and that, that's power of God that, that flows. And, and even, even case in point, I, 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 I do motivational speaking. And then I'll have people come up to me. These two young ladies came up to me of this past week and say, you are a pastor. You are a preacher. I know you're a pastor. And they said, wait a minute. Let me ask you, are you a pastor? I go, yeah, you're right. Now, again, I preach. I don't give motiv motivational speeches in church. When I go to schools and do motivational speeches, the preach comes out. So do whole, everything as unto the Lord. And he'll reveal himself through the things that you do. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I just praise you. I thank you for us staying usable. Stand usable. Lord God, whatever it is, here I am, send me. Father God, I know that if I come to you and if I'm really in your presence, I'm going to want to give an offering. I'm going to want to give. And the offering is the, the offering is not just about money, but it is about me wanting to offer you who I am and what I am. Father, I thank you. I thank you for the power of receiving and giving. And Lord God, we receive ourselves being usable by the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless. Stay in it. Keep lifting us up and we'll be praying for you as well. See you next time. Bye-bye.